Amen. Well, I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. Having finished Ruth, we usually take a couple of sermons uh, to preach about things that have been um, on my heart or things that have been just gripping uh, my own affections. And this morning we'll be looking at a text from Exodus 35 um, and just to see how detailed God is in his workings, in his view of beauty and skill, something that I think is long forgotten by the church. And sadly, we're living <clears throat> in the ruins of that uh, poor, poor memory. Exodus 35, we'll read from verse 30 through the end of the chapter. The word of the living God says, Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, the son of the, tri of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and, bro and bronze, and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine uh, twine linen or by a weaver or by any sort of workman or skilled designer. Let's ask the Lord, Lord for help in this text. Our gracious God, we come again to you asking for help as we continue our worship through the word preached. And all of your scripture is breathed out by you. All of it is useful. All of it is good. And all of it gives insight into who you are, insight into your wisdom, insight into your purposes. Even what seems to be an obscure text here in Exodus about the construction of the temple, it's anything but obscure. It actually uh, shows the manifold wisdom that you have, even as it pertains to artistry, to skill, to beauty. Lord, help us to truly captiv be captivated by your beauty and to be those who love the beautiful works of God. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. If I were to ask you what it means to be a mature Christian, what, uh, what Christian maturity could be um, defined as, what would you say to that? Maybe you would say someone who's uh, just so theologically astute, someone who, know, who knows uh, all the theology in the world, someone who is, is calm and doesn't even laugh at funny jokes, someone who uh, strokes their chin whenever it's a good conversation about theology, but gets upset whenever it goes away from theology. Is that what it means to be uh, someone who's mature as a Christian? Well, primarily, I think maturity is found in being conformed to the image of Christ, being conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's sometimes when we even hear that, being conformed to the image of Christ, because of the Christian culture that we've all kind of been uh, raised around, we even think about pietistic elements of the image of Christ. What, what do I mean by that? I don't mean piety. Piety is good. Piety is holiness, right? I mean pietistic in the sense of when we say being conformed to the image of Christ, your mind goes to something like, oh, when Christ is praying, I need to be conformed to that image. And I would say, okay, sure, amen, absolutely. Uh, what about partying at a, at a wedding? Is that being conformed to the image of Christ? Well, I don't really know because it's not really a spiritual thing. I mean, my Lord partied up at the wedding of Cana. That's where he performed his first miracle. That's where he brought out the best wine. So I want us to see that being conformed to the image of Christ isn't just purely pietistic. It's being conformed to him in all areas of life, no end. I mean, Christ would have been someone who enjoyed a good laugh. He would have been someone who would have enjoyed both, yes, prayer with his Lord and a wedding celebration as well. Christ enjoyed fellowship. He had a group around him. So we need to see that uh, as Christians who seek to be mature in this life, it's not just purely pietistic things. It's are we mature in every sphere of life and all details of life? Do we approach different um, spheres of our life and say, am I being a mature Christian here? In fact, what does maturity look like in this field at this time? Let me give a quick story just to perhaps illustrate this more. At one point, uh, early on in my reform journey, we went to a reform church and we walk in and uh, everyone seemed nice, everyone was delightful. And you know, I talked to the, the pastor there and he was you know, a very uh, bubbly guy, just, hey, how's it going? You know, uh, um, 
it's, it's so good to have you here. Blah, blah. And then he stepped into the pulpit, and it's, good morning, brothers and sisters. So delighted that you are accompanying us here in the presence of the Lord on this Lord's Day. It's like, that's not the guy I just talked to at the door. That's a completely different guy, right? And just this, this, this pietistic, uh, you know, understanding of, and I'm not saying that we should be up here irreverent, but that's someone else. And, and that's trying to communicate something about, you know, when he steps into the pulpit, he has to become a different person. And I think that that's a false view of what I'm trying to get at. In fact, at that pulpit, there was, um, you know, the, those 1980 decor. If you have decor in your house that reflects this, I'm sorry, but it's not, it's just not pretty, okay? It's like this, like, gold, you know, the gold uh, uh, flowers and floral stuff, you know, everywhere around the pulpit. And then you turn on their screen. I mean... Our, our setup isn't the best, but we're meeting at a school, right? But they have their own building, and they turn on the screen, and it's the worst opaque color, and it's white letters, and you can't even tell what you're reading. And then they're playing this 1965 track to a company. It just was chaos everywhere. And yet, I'm saying, I mean, they're not against the uh, uh, technology. They're, they're using a projector. They have a screen. They have music playing. Uh, they, we can inform our beauty because God is the creator of nature. Even think about the beautiful harmony between the male anatomy and the female anatomy. Adults, you know what I'm talking about. That fits in a way that is contrary to nature. That doesn't fit with what is going on in this world. There's beauty even in the creation of our bodies where it fits. So if you want to see, okay, what is beautiful, look at God's creation and say, what does God call beautiful? How does God create? In what manner does God uh, give us beauty and our eyes behold it? I mean, what is happening there? What colors are at play there? What patterns are happening there? See, all we do as Christians is we just discover what God has called beautiful. We're not creating anything. We're sub-creators under the true creator. Again, this is far more important than I think we realize. As Christians, we must think God's thoughts after him as we create. And as we do that, this is part of our dominion Mandate. This is part of us taking dominion in this world as we truly show the advancement of God's culture in this world. In chapel recently at the Academy for the Kids, I was explaining to them how in Genesis, you have God telling Adam where all these raw materials are at. There's onyx, there's gold, there's all this raw material, and that's it. That, he doesn't say, you know, go and do this. He doesn't say, uh, you have to build tools. It's just part of what he must do. Adam, in order to truly harvest the gold and to use it, he must build tools to go get that. Do you think Adam's going to be scratching at the side of a mountain trying to make a, a mine to get the gold? No, he has to build tools that are beautiful, that are efficient, that are good. And he has to take that gold and find a way to harvest it and make it beautiful to make rings out of it, to make earrings out of it, to create beauty out of what God has given us. That's what I'm driving at, is that God has instilled in his people, in his creation, that we are called to be sub-creators and take all of God's raw materials, as it were, and seek to turn and make them better. And then when we do make them better, it's not like God is saying, I didn't know we can do that. God is saying, thank you. I always knew we could do that. So much so that the descendants of Adam and Eve, uh, Cain and Abel, Cain ends up in Genesis 4 saying he built a whole city. A whole city is built by Cain. And his descendants were excellent in bronze and iron working. And, and, and they made instruments. One generation later, could you imagine, in the garden, God says, here's this world. And one generation later, there's a city. There's instruments. There's bronze. There's iron. That's dominion taking. So this is why this matters, church. <clears throat> this this is why it's super important for us to take beauty seriously. <clears throat> God, God truly loves beauty. And so we need to love what God loves, beauty included. We're not potent in this area because we think God doesn't care about it. And guess what? Our enemies care about it. Our enemies are harvesting lithium and making it into a useful thing. Our enemies are out there making the most out of silicone and making useful you know, computer chips out of silicone. Because Christians have become so pie in the sky when it comes to their faith, 
The enemy is advancing his kingdom through technology, through advancements, through all these things that, that, that they're creating. And here are Christians just saying, well, maybe one day we'll just get zapped out of this place. And yet, what do you do? You turn your phone on and you make use of what? Things that the enemies of God are producing. But why won't you produce it? Why won't you get involved in this fight? Why do you just consume all this goodness and don't see yourself as maybe we as Christians called to be kings and priests on this earth, maybe we're the ones that should be producing these things. Maybe we should be the ones producing beauty. Maybe we are the ones that should be informing the world on what true beauty looks like. So we need to learn what, what beauty is. First, we need to see that God is a standard, and then we need to learn what beauty is, and then we, we need to seek to implement this. In fact, consider the text that says here in our text that the Spirit of God was given to these individuals. That's how intertwined God is with artistry, with beauty. It's an example of the Spirit of God being with them. And when you do a study on the Spirit of God, you actually see this absolutely fits. Who was the one that was hovering over the creation? The Spirit of God. Who was the one that is, brings new creation there? The Spirit of God. Who's the one that gave you a new heart? The Spirit of God. Who's uh, redeeming in you all the things that were fallen in Adam? The Spirit of God. So I would even say that as you look at nature, trees every single day continue to grow. By what? By the Spirit of God causing that to be the case. Unless you think this is just happening naturally, well, it's just the way it naturally happens. Who is sustaining even the, the cycle of trees? Who's sustaining this world right now? God by his spirit. So you can't look at a tree without seeing God by his spirit is sustaining that tree right now. And that's a beautiful tree. That's why you see the spirit of God identified here in these men because they are the ones who are given creative abilities by the spirit who is a creative person in the Trinity of God. So all this, all this reflects God's triune work. All this reflects God's goodness. All this is how we truly become mature in Christ. Beauty is one of those aspects. So for you, whatever your craft is, I don't know what you do for a living. I know what some of you do for a living. Uh, I don't know what your Mondays or Fridays, uh, Fridays look like exactly, but I want you to start thinking, am I living these Monday through Fridays in a way that is beautiful? Am I excellent in my craft? Am I bringing God glory in what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day life? What, I mean, if you're a homemaker, are you making your home beautiful? If you are you know, working construction, are you doing that construction work in a way that shows you have skill and you care for excellence? Are you seeking to be innovative? Have you ever noticed that where God is honored, it's always more beautiful? Always. Where God is honored in a family, that family is always more beautiful. And where God is not honored, it's always ugly. It's chaotic. Because there's a pattern to the life that God has given us. When God has given us a standard for beauty and we walk in that way, a beautiful life will come about, even in the ugliness that surrounds that life. But again, Christians have been so bad at this. And then we wonder why our children are going to the ways of the world because they see the beauty that's out there. Now, we can't call that ugly because if they're just creating and it reflects God's beauty, but they don't just put God on top of it, they're saying that they're the standard and, and, and they're the, the wise ones. The beauty's still there, and our children are, are, are drawn to that because Christians think beauty doesn't matter. Beauty absolutely matters. Christians need to make things that are beautiful, need to live lives that are beautiful. And so, if beauty can be seen by the standard that God has given us, as we see in our text, God himself knows that there's a skillful way to create. There's a skillful way to, 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 to display beauty. If that is the case, then I'm saying that as Christians, we must be seeking to show the beauty of God in all of life. It's not an option for us. No, we must be doing this. So, for example, we need to show the beauty of manhood and womanhood as Christians. We need to show that it's, it's a beautiful thing for men to be men, to do what men ha have been called to do. That is a beautiful thing. It's not something to be ashamed of. It is a beautiful thing for a woman to truly be walking in the ways of the Lord in all aspects of that. 
We shouldn't be ashamed of the roles that God has given to us. No, we should exemplify that it is so beautiful. It's not toxic. It's beautiful. It's, it's not oppression for women. It's beautiful for women. And we need to be Christians who show that delight, who, who display that beauty to the world. We need to show the beauty of a Christian family to the world. We need to show the beauty of Christian marriage. In fact, your marriage should display the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's more beautiful than that? What's more important than that? So in your marriage, you should be seeking to display to the world what it looks like for Christ to love the church and the church to submit to Christ and display all that glory, all that beauty, all that splendor. Ask Christians, do we care about the beauty of our families? I'm not talking about physical attraction. I'm talking about the way that our family is perceived by those around us. Do they see a man who's truly leading his family or do they see a man who's been neutered by his wife and his children do not respect him? That's embarrassing. That's ugly. Do we see the beauty of children who love their parents? Do we see the beauty of children themselves? The blessing that children are to families and to this world. One psalm says, oh, how beautiful, how good it is when brothers dwell in unity. Are we showing the world how beautiful the Christian community is? How beautiful it is to have brothers and sisters in the Lord. Do we, you know, funny story, my brother, uh, he's not a believer. I don't think he listens to my YouTube videos or anything like that, so I'm not worried about saying this. Yesterday, uh, last Sunday, a bunch of us were hanging out at Canyon Crest, and Ricardo was on some benches, and he was pointing at the kids, and we were playing a game called Empire, and the kids are going crazy, and we're having a good time. Everyone's laughing, and my brother drives by, and he texts me later on that week and said, I didn't want to stop you guys, because it looks like you guys were having a great time, and I didn't want to interrupt. I mean, and he's not a believer, and he says, basically saying, it looked like a, a beautiful time. Now, I don't know may, I mean, what he's going through. I don't know if he's able to think about that beyond what he's able to think about. But all I know that he recognized, who are all these people hanging out on a Sunday afternoon having a good time together? And you know how many times we've been out at, in public places as a church, and people always ask us, well, is, are you guys some type of like group? Is this like a Facebook group that's just meeting up? And then we say, no, we're just a bunch of church people hanging out after church. And you guys do this all the time. Yeah, we do it all the time. We don't have a church building, so we do it here at Canyon Crest almost all the time. Why is that? Because people don't even have community anymore. Even people in churches don't have community anymore. Why? Because they're just taught to consume and leave. Consume and leave. <clears throat> My voice is going, hold on. <clears throat> So those little examples is the beauty of community is able to be seen even by those who aren't Christian. Even by those who maybe will never even step foot in a church, but they see what is going on here. This is not normal because the world wants to sell us <clears throat> isolation as the norm. The world wants us to think we have community because we have 500 followers on Instagram. And then you see those people in real life, and you walk right by them. Well, they follow me, but I don't really talk to them like that. So there's no community there. It's a false community. It's a false view of marriage. It's a false view of manhood and womanhood. Everything that you're being force-fed all the time through culture and media is the opposite of God's beauty. They want to steal the little good parts of it, but they sell you a bill of, go a bill of goods. And all we are doing is saying we need to produce the opposite of that. We need to produce the truth of God's word and display Christian Life is beautiful, church. Christian culture is absolutely beautiful. And I truly believe that most pastors don't want to turn their members into producers. They just want them to consume, 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 because that makes you easier to control. That makes you more tame, more docile. That makes uh, members of a church more willing to say, yes, pastor, yes, pastor. Here's my money, pastor. Yeah. And I'm saying, forget that. I see all of you as kings and priests that are called to produce goodness and beauty in your life, church. 
in every aspect of your life. I want to see all you men give the most beautiful display of manhood and the most beautiful display of what it is to be a husband and a father to your children. I want to see all your children run up to you and love you for being a good dad to them. I want to see your wife embrace you for being a good husband to her. And all the same in every role, children with parents. I want parents to look at their children and delight over them. You know how much life would change for children growing up in this world if their parents just loved them and cared for them? We need to just, uh, display that beauty, church. It's so easy to display it. You want to know why? Because it's so good for us. It's a joyful thing to display the joy of what God has given us. And I want you to truly not see yourself as merely someone who consumes all these things, but who produces all these things. You consume the word of God. You consume the Lord's Supper. You consume all the means of grace. But you consume these things to go out and produce these things in real life. All displaying God's beautiful life. God's beautiful culture that he's given to us. That's what I pray. I pray my entire ministry is just teaching Christians that they can actually be useful and produce good things in this life. And I pray that this, in turn, produces a more beautiful world for us. I pray that our children, in 20 years, have much better music talent up here. I pray that our children, in 10 years, 20 years, won't have to turn to a neighbor to find out who's a good mechanic. They know, oh, we know a good mechanic in the church. We know someone who's skilled in that craft. We know someone that could help with construction. We know a good real estate agent. We know someone who could paint your house. We know someone who could do these skills and these trades and these crafts. And they're all within our church because we see the beauty of it in every detail of life. It's the Christian family actually believing that God cares about our life, our skills, our trades, and saying, how can we be excellent in them? We know people who've started their own businesses. We know people who are entrepreneurs, and they're all here in our local church because we care about this life, because we want to create a beautiful life, because we're not just saying, oh, it's all about just getting up there someday. No, it's what we've been called to do here on this earth. If we're partaking of, of people who do not love the Lord, if we're partaking of all their goodness, and we're saying, well, we're the Christians that are doing this goodness. We're the Christians who are producing this much talent. It's because we have lost sight of God's true care for this side of eternity. God cares about this life. So much so he's asking for people to come and design his temple. And it's the same today. What are we going to do in this new creation that we've been given? I pray, church, I pray that one day there's someone up here playing the piano that comes from our line, from our children. I pray that there's someone one day that designs all of our invitations and all of that, and it's their craft. I pray that one day we'll have truly, from top to bottom, from every field, someone who knows how to do things well in their craft, and we could turn to them and say, let's keep on supporting that. Let's keep on investing in that. Let's keep on truly looking at each other and say, who can I bless in this church with this skill and craft, and let's reward them to that end. Let me make one even little point on cathedrals. You ever wonder why in a day before power tools, in a day before bulldozers, in a day before uh, scaffolding that went all the way to, you know, 120 flights, why are those buildings better than our buildings? All of our buildings are just four concrete walls put up at the same time. Because they, at that time, the, the Christians of those days said, this cathedral that we're building, I'll never even see the finished point. But we're communicating with this cathedral generational living, legacy. We're displaying the beauty of God. We're showing the transcendence of God as the, the, the cathedral points to the sky and seeking to bring down heaven to earth, as it were. We're communicating theology, philosophy, epistemology, metaphysics, all in one building, in just the cathedral. That's why the Christians of days gone by, they recognize that beauty mattered, and they say, we're going to build the best buildings, the most, the most appealing buildings. And to this day, Atheists, haters of Christianity, where are they going? To the cathedrals of old, to see what they built, to gaze upon the beauty that Christians built. And Christians abandoned those buildings long ago because that doesn't matter. Our buildings don't matter. The way we dress doesn't matter. The way that we communicate our family to others doesn't matter. Church, it absolutely matters. Beauty matters. God cares about beauty, and it truly 
matters. So now, with this wisdom, the most beautiful thing doesn't always fit. What do I mean by that? A woman on her wedding day wears a wedding gown because that looks most beautiful. If she were to come in those doors right now, it would be very awkward to see a woman in a wedding dress come into this room right now. It doesn't fit. You know, some type of orchestra up here, it doesn't fit. So I'm not saying we need the most beauty in all occasions. I'm saying what beauty fits where? That's where wisdom comes in. That's where we need to truly apply these things. We can't check out on these exercises as it were. And this is where we actually miss the point in so many different spheres of life. For instance, we could say that in many, many churches this morning, there's a team up here singing, and they sound way better than we do. Okay? They have the music cranked all the way up. You can't see anyone. You can't hear anyone. And that looks musically good. From a production standpoint, those churches are on point. But is that the beauty that they've been called to do on a Sunday morning? No, the beauty of a Sunday morning is the saints of God, the congregational singing being heard as not good as it may be at times. That's the standard. That's the beauty for that morning. What about the beauty of preaching God's word? It is a beautiful thing to preach the word of God. It's a beautiful thing of him who brings good news. That's a beautiful thing. But when you have a woman standing up in the pulpit on a Sunday morning, it's no longer beautiful. Is it because women can't preach? That's not why. It's because they're not called to preach. Is it because women aren't articulate and they're not smart? That's not why. It's because they've not, they've not been called to that task. So a beautiful thing in the improper place is not God's design. We can run through this all the time. Where does beauty fit and how does it fit? But that first presupposes that we're thinking in terms of God actually cares about beauty. And he does, church. How do I know that God cares about beauty? Look at the story that he has told from beginning to end. He opens up the Bible with a man called Adam. You know what he calls his son? The last Adam. God's creating a picture for you to be able to say, what that Adam lost, my Adam, the last Adam, will reverse. He's setting up all these pictures and shadows of, of lambs being sacrificed, of bronze serpents being lifted up, of, of Samson uh, crushing his enemies as his hands are out on the pillar. He's creating all these symbols and all these types and all these shadows, and then here comes Christ and fulfills them perfectly. Beautiful balance in the story of God. He is creating for himself a, a picture of him, of someone who hates wrath, someone who must punish sin, someone who must be just in his punishment of sin, and then he says, but I'm the justifier of sinners. Beautiful balance. He's wiping away our sin, and he's providing for us the righteousness that we need to get into glory. God cares about beauty so much that he spends uh, ages upon ages upon ages telling the glorious story of the most beautiful story ever told surrounding the beauty of the cross, where God's wrath and mercy meet, where his justice and his grace meet. All of God's uh, attributes and perfections are on display on the cross of Calvary. All of his perfections truly there displayed for us so we can look at that beauty and say, that's how beautiful God is, that he has spent centuries upon centuries getting us to the moment of the beautiful cross where the perfect one is slain for the sinless ones. That's artistry. That's beautiful. The just for the unjust. I mean, think about even the play on words there. The just for the unjust, the spotless ones for the filthy ones. It's creating pictures in our minds to say, we deserve to be there, yet he doesn't, and he dies for me, the unjust one. And it's all this balance just coming to beautiful, beautiful completion in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the way that God tells the story of his own son is done in a way that is beautiful, that has build up and build up and build up until the climax of the cross of Calvary. And why does he spend so much time doing that? I mean, think about it. Why didn't God just Genesis 1 through 3, the fall happens, Genesis 4, Jesus comes and reverses the curse. He doesn't do that because he wants to display all this beauty, all this wisdom, all these prophecies being fulfilled in Christ, all this narrative coming to an exact point in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then think about that. He rises on the third day and he doesn't bring back the, uh, the, the, the kingdom on day four. No, he gives us all of human history to now live in light of that. 
to go and create something beautiful because Christ is king. God is so into beauty, he's spending decades and millennia upon millennia to display the beauty of his kingdom in all the earth. From the way that we dress to our Sunday mornings, from the way that we organize our family, from our Monday through Friday to Christ's return, both spectrums of insignificance and significance. God cares about all of that, church. So what do I want for you, church? I want you to truly be salt and light in this earth as you create beautiful works of skilled craftsmanship in whatever you do this week. Because beauty attracts, and your God cares about beauty. If we're going to build the new Christendom, if we're going to be truly those who make a culture here before us, then it's going to create us seeing ourselves, not merely as consumers of God's grace, but those in light of God's grace go and produce beautiful things for him, who produce God-glorifying music for him, who produce movies and art and media for him. I pray that one day someone will have a better skill of the art of preaching and homiletics in this pulpit far better than me because he cared about the craft of preaching and homiletics. I pray that our children and our children's children will inherit a church building that we cared about the color of it. We cared about the design of it. And we didn't just say, oh, it works. That's fine. It'll, it'll do. No, that we actually intentionally thought out about the details of the way we designed our building when the Lord gives us that building. I pray that we would truly invest to all these ends, even, even so, because God cares about these ends. I'll make one last little point. You live in a country that has been formed by the most beautiful political document known to man called the U.S. Constitution. Form and freedom, putting uh, the Tyranny of man at bay because it's by the consent of the people and we are given rights by God, not man. You know how much artistry went into that document? How much wisdom went into that document? Is it perfect? No, but it's the best we've ever known. Why? Because people of those days said, we need to create a system that is informed by the beauty and the law of God. What's more beautiful? The, man of, the, the law of man that leads to chaos or the, God, uh, the law of God that leads to freedom and joy? One is beautiful, one is ugly. How do we know that? God informs it. I mean, I could go on all day, church, displaying God's beauty versus man's false beauty. And all I'm saying is, start thinking about that. As you live your life, ask yourself, am I making whatever little sphere I'm in, am I making this more beautiful? Am I bringing God's word to bear here? Am I displaying that God cares about beauty? And am I leaving it more beautiful than I found it? You start to live your life like that. And you see, you'll see God's potent just skill in the art of beauty, church.